So I was trying to get by without talking about the layout, uh, in part because there's a lot to talk about on the passenger operations. And secondly, I made very little contribution to the uh, design and construction of the layout. I think my one suggestion that got made was to put reversing loops at the end of the staging areas so we could uh, turn the passenger trains. So that was about it. So a, quick, a few quick statistics, uh, point to point, two levels. There's two helices, you'll see them later. Uh, Cheyenne to Ogden, UP's Wyoming division. It's a 125th roughly scale length. So in addition to Cheyenne and Ogden, we also um, implement the Oregon Short Line to Portland, the Park City branch, and a Denver destination. Uh, except for Park City, those other two are not really modeled, they're just uh, storage areas. So the double track main line is 1,100 feet long, um, three tracks on the east side of Sherman Hill. It takes um, 45 to 60 minutes to make a one-way trip from Cheyenne to Ogden or vice versa. Uh, the guys up there tell me that there's actually about a mile of HO track total. And they also tell me there are over 900 places to spot a freight car. Um, having hardly ever run a freight train, I'll take their word for it. So uh, a couple hundred locomotives, 2,400 freight cars, but apparently only 1,800 out on the layout at any one time. We have around 160 passenger rail express cars. Uh, there were 130 something when we started. We had a few more. I haven't counted them for a while, so I don't know how many there are. So here we go. I just thank you. This is the upper level track plan. Um, the building has um, a front door over in the side. This is the back wall. This is Cheyenne. This whole length of the back wall is Cheyenne. Uh, Cheyenne staging and uh, it's actually got a few more tracks now, more storage tracks. And inside the helix is the reversing loop. So under Cheyenne storage is Ogden storage and under Cheyenne is Ogden. So the other thing to mention is that there's a mezzanine that runs across above the layout in this direction, as you'll see it in some pictures and also uh, some pictures from it. So if we're headed west, we uh, exit Cheyenne past Tower A go up Sherman Hill on tracks one or two, hit the Continental Divide about here, go through and change from right hand to left hand running down the west side of Sherman Hill into Laramie, Laramie Yard. Leave Laramie, go through a bunch of little bitty places and go past one of two coal yards that are uh, part of the operation scheme. Uh, this is Sinclair, this is Rollins. Sinclair is the Sinclair refinery. Rollins is the station stop. We leave there and now we really go through a lot of nothing. Except we get over here, you'll notice maybe that there's a, a middle passing siding. It's one of the few places on the layout where we can overtake freight trains. Of course, back in the day of 57, 1957, uh, this was not bi-directional running. So you pretty much don't have any head-ons. So here's the helix that goes down to the lower level. The other helix is over here go quickly between the staging yards. So you get down to the bottom level, you go back through all this under, underneath. Here's where uh, Green River Yard is uh, and so on. Uh, enter the Wasatch Canyon, go down through the Wasatch Canyon and then on into Ogden. So that's it in a nutshell. Here's hey, a, one, a view one, Hey Bob, yeah. can I interrupt just a second? Um, yeah. uh, for more information about this layout, if you go to the opsig.org slash virtual page, Bob provided a comprehensive document with lots and lots of videos of the layout. Um, we, we've talked before how video through video simply doesn't work. So please go take a take a look at those. I mean, it's, it's an amazing layout and um, I'm trying to figure out if I can get down there for, for Arizona <laughs> in the fall. So be sure to take, a, take advantage of that information. Go, okay, go ahead, Bob. So I call this almost one quarter of the layout. It's impossible to uh, take a picture of the whole layout because it fills, basically fills the, uh, what is it, uh, 55 by 70 foot uh, industrial building. Here's the mezzanine I was talking about. So we're standing over the east, the west end of Cheyenne Yard. It's almost one quarter of the layout because Cheyenne Yard was all the way down here. 
this is up Sherman Hill, so on. This is way before much in the way scenery and so on. And then on the other side of the, this is the upper level, on the other side of the mezzanine is another view like this. And then down underneath, there are two more views like this. Not all the sheeting was up, so you can kind of see some people on the lower level. When you get down there in those aisles on the lower level, you might as well be all to yourself in a corner of Wyoming. Uh, Hack sent me some great pictures and even some, some short videos. I don't think we'll have time for them, but if we want to hang around afterwards, I can run through and probably take five or 10 minutes. Uh, the uh, references I gave are uh, terribly short of uh, passenger trains in the videos. So this is a passenger train going up Sherman Hill westbound. I should say a word about the backdrops. So everything in back of this cut of cars is the backdrop. The backdrop for the whole layout was done by a commercial artist. He used Google Earth to get the terrain, uh, photoshopped in uh, appropriate vehicles, things like that. And uh, when you don't have a stereo view, the backdrop just merges right into the foreground. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. Okay, briefly operations. Um, when I say Wyoming Division, I mean the Model Railroad. I mean, if I want to talk about the prototype, I say UP Wyoming Division. Um, NCE, radio and wired, no smartphone access at this time. Uh, completely automatic uh, block system. Uh, in some of the areas, it also indicates uh, route as well as whether the blocks are clear or whatever. Phones for dispatching, uh, no CTC. Although I understand that the Oregon Short Line and some other areas had some in 57. Again, in the attempt to uh, duplicate 1957, just telephones. Fortunately, we don't have any telegraph. So we have two kinds of operating sessions. We have a monthly one. That was a pretty sparse area here. We, we draw from middle part of Arizona up to Flagstaff down into Scottsdale and Phoenix. Occasionally folks from Albuquerque will come over. So we get 15 to 20 operators run about six hours, run about 30 trains, 40 trains, I don't know. Semi-annually, there's the uh, invitational uh, in um, February, and um, then uh, part of Desert Ops. Sometimes there are two, sometimes there are one. We get 35 operators, we figure it can hold 40. Uh, typically, I run a couple seven hour days, you know, 125 trains or so, all told. Freight Ops, card system, uh, Beryl had a uh, nice article in the May Model Railroad, um, obvious, uh, so on. Uh, dispatching for freight, freight trains seems to be, they leave when they're ready. Uh, I want to, don't go on it, I want, don't want to get into dispatching, but I think there's a basic problem because as opposed to 1957, everybody there is trying to run a train as opposed to having 99% of the people phoning into dispatchers and so on. So. Uh, things are a little, uh, little awkward there. A couple of blank ones for some reason. So I got my information from a map. This is a tiny corner of the map. It was the um, uh, Wyoming Division, UP Wyoming Division, uh, 901 p.m. on January something in 1941, which isn't 1947, but there are a lot, of, a lot of similarities when you start looking at the timetables. So little triangles indicate a train. They point to the direction it's going. The brown ones are freight trains. The red ones are passenger trains. Passenger trains have a little legend here giving the train number. And then there's a, a legend down in the corner that uh, actually has a local one. Um, so a couple things to know. You can see eastbound and westbound are running passenger trains are running at the same time. <clears throat> and they're running in both directions. And there's another big cluster over by Arc and and it's the same thing. So what happens when we analyze this map? Well, um, we have 11 eastbound passenger trains on the y UP Wyoming Division at the same time, nine westbound, a couple of mixed. So that means there's around 22 uh, um, passenger sorts of trains. Total trains is 48. Um, every time I count, I get a different number it's somewhere between 44 and 48. So almost half the trains are passenger trains. So the UP passenger operations, you've seen the map, um, they ran in groups, so on. City, mail and express trains, local trains, 
the city trains, the streamliners are all 15 to 18 cars long. And we do model some switching operations, some of which are invented, uh, but we don't do any switching operations at Cheyenne or Ogden. <clears throat> well, it's model railroading, so you have to make compromises. So we only had enough rolling stock to model one concess for each train. Whoops, we can't run both eastbound and westbound at the same time. We also decided, since it's only 1 25th the actual length, that we'd restrict it to two or three passenger trains out there at one time. City train length, we limit to nine to 11 cars plus the locomotive. We put together a 15 car one. It was the length of the Cheyenne yard, which I think is on the order of 10 miles, which it looked terrible. We use the NCE clock. We, we run real time, but not all clock time. I don't know. When I'm running a fast clock, I have no idea how long things are going to take. So the wall clock can, can be reset. The uh, run times are 50 to 55 minutes. We start out at time 0000. zero, zero, zero. We make it through most operating sessions with never having to reset the, the clock. So we, every uh, passenger train operation operator has a hammerhead display. There's one electronic display in the middle aisle, double facing display. Uh, my good friend Hack tried to use his own, or uses his own watch. He discovered we're slow on the NCE clock, so we actually run a slow clock. Here's what we model. Uh, we model four of the city trains, city of LA. These are the origin destination. Uh, city of LA runs in two sections. First is Pullman, second is Coach, which they did in the summer. City of St. Louis, we do a sleeper drop and pick up in Green River. It wasn't actually Green River where it happened. And in the 50s, every timetable had a different number one of these kind of operations. So I just said, what the heck? Uh, city of Portland's pretty straightforward. City of San Francisco usually has a fancy sleeper on the rear end. It's really interesting. The Walters model for the op uh, observation car uh, has been modified for mid-train operation. So the uh, fancy sleeper is just tacked on the end. We have a challenger put together. We never get a chance to run it. We don't have enough operators. We don't have enough times. Uh, Mail Express, three trains, 16 to 20 cars. The Cheyenne to Ogden has two sections, Denver to Portland. And then there's a Portland to Green River, which makes kind of an interesting situation. Got a couple of local trains. We do a little trick where the Portland to Denver local picks up a, a diner in Green River, eastbound, westbound, it drops it. Never saw such a thing on the uh, UP Wyoming division, but back in the day, there were a lot of this kind of thing going on. <clears throat> we also have a business car, the Cheyenne, and a modernized heavyweight op observation car for charters, and we work those into the uh, operations. Here's a chunk of the timetable, uh, kind of typical. Here's the stops, westbound you read down, eastbound you read up. <clears throat> Um, bold are the stops, the other one's in there for information. Uh, across the top are the local numbers. We use the local numbers for dispatching because it's the most visible. Uh, the parentheses mean, means we can safely annul that train if we don't have enough operators. The slash separates section one from section two. And we have preserved the UP train numbers and the names. You'll notice something really interesting. This one departs at 000, this one departs at 545, this one departs at one. Well, that's not right. And that's because I made a decision early on to have the out from the middle times represent roughly the order that they ran on the UP. So we run them at a different order. So for example, the first departure is an A, B, and C. So one leaves at 00, another one leaves at 00, and a third one it leaves at 00 which has two sections. So one of the neat things that happens is this one terminates Green River and this one picks up its cars from that. So that's about that. Um, time kill, we've been using it for about four years. Um, clipboard for each train, the three uh, clear plastic slates, timetable, train orders, uh, special operations, drops, pickups, flag stops and so on. The forms are all reused, so we leave them in the plastic sleeves. Um, Timetables are posted on the fascia at eight different locations. The very top in the, in the collection on the clipboard is the timetable with the train that the clipboard is for, marked on it with um, red arrows. 
Uh, and, uh, and we talked about that. I hate the clipboards. Uh, we got Velcro on the back. Uh, the Velcro places to snap them up to the flash. I'm always leaving the stupid things behind, but that's the way it goes. So to run the full timetable, which is all 11 trains out and back, takes about six and a half, six, six and a half hours. So we don't quite make it during the, the monthly ones. Uh, yeah, so here's a real pro uh, problem. If you mix up your Cheyenne and Denver destinations, you're not in deep doo-doo because Denver is just a piece of Cheyenne. If you mix up the Ogden and Portland destinations, you are in big trouble because the only way to get from the main on the Oregon short line, it doesn't have a Y. So there's only one direction you can go to Portland and only one direction you can come from. So if you end up in Portland, you're supposed to be in Ogden. It really screws things up. Departure times on a timetable, except for final arrival. Stops are two real-time minutes, sometimes two sub-stops, one for the coaches and one for the sleepers. We only change the clock unless we get way behind, because one of the big things that our passenger train operators like is sticking to the timetable. No fun if you're an hour and a half late. All that, that you know, could obviously be a realistic situation. We do a little fudging um, if we get too far behind. Um, here's, some, here's some of the switching ops. These transfer of cars, picking up and dropping sleepers, stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of that didn't happen, but you know, model rearing is supposed to be fun. I don't, I can't figure out what streamline diagrams they're telling me. So I invented this thing I call a track occupancy. So these are 15 minutes, again, real time slots. This is the train order, in departure order. The arrow, westbound or eastbound, parentheses are the ones we know and so on, and the two means times two. So you can see, here's the ones that leave. Uh, this one needs to be update to a times two. So this one stops, this one starts, these two stop, this one starts. So it's all interlocked. So it's a real uh, puzzle when you get going on this. Again, this is just a little piece of it. We don't send out new operators, we give them a mentor. Uh, we have always two dedicated Passenger train operators have priority. Sometimes we need more. So I keep a list of people who would like to run a passenger train, not spend the whole session running them. Then I go around and harvest them you know, when a passenger train departure is coming up. The second section, one of the great things we do is sometimes run uh, new operators as a, a, on the second section. Follow that train is basically what we tell them and so on. What do the operators like? Oh, the challenge of the timetable operations and really, really beautiful train. Yard masters, a lot happens in, in Laramie and Green River. I've got a, a sheet for all the four yard masters, giving them the times, what them, times trains arrive, what the, um, what the operations might be, what the work needs to be done. Passenger trains don't stop at the yard limits, whoever heard of that. So either the dispatcher, or if we get a yard master that's on the ball, they'll actually know when the passenger train is coming, but we go ahead and tell them one's coming up. Number one advice, keep those main lines in the yards clear. Otherwise you've got trains backed up everywhere, including the passenger trains. So there's uh, several of us that are mentors, me, a uh, local, John DiCrincenzo, who's actually a three rail guy, but happens to like passenger trains. And Nick, who's a long time volunteer, unfortunately Nick likes to run freight trains too. So we usually release him from passenger service a couple hours into it. So we turn and restage trains. We assign operators to trains. Restaging is a lot of work because those things turn around and go out again and not or in various uh, order too. So it's pretty tricky. There's an operation session center at the front door where I make my base. Uh, we have stuff there and so on. And the three of us move around the layout. Typically, if we have enough operators, we don't get to run a train. For short operators, John and I will take turns running a train or being the passenger train superintendent. So bottom line, have fun. So I've added these things um, uh, that Eric put out on the uh, um, his um, emails. I also have available the up, upgrade updates that Hack sent me last evening at the last minute. Of course, I hadn't really communicated with him until the last minute. And if you want, I don't think there's time now. Is there, Eric? Uh, time for 
to run through some of these extra pictures and stuff. No, we're we're really we're kind of we're kind of crunched on time. If you've got a new document that you'd like me to put up, I'd be happy to replace what's there up well, on the Opsig well, site with your new new document. What I'd really like to do is if we stay over, people who are interested could stay over. I could run through those. It only takes five or ten minutes. That's fine. We'll we'll do that at the we'll do that at the end. Sounds um, good. So um, uh, just looking in, let me take a look through the. Are you all set? I've, I've, there's a few questions here. Sure. Um, the first question is, do the passenger trains have any work along the way? Do they have to swap cars out? Do they have any any work to do? Yeah, that went by pretty fast. I mean, not much of that happened on the UP Wyoming division, but I decided that's no fun because, you know, switching passenger uh, cars and so on en route is a thing that happened a lot in the 50s. And, you know, we have real situations for which all those things happen. It just didn't happen to happen on the UP Wyoming division in 1957. Got it. Um, do the freights hold up the passenger trains a lot like they do with Amtrak? <laughs> the other way around. This is 1957 people and the UP stayed pretty much, you know, good operations with passenger trains till, till Amtrak train took over. Uh, we uh, typically, we, in, during the monthly sessions, we don't have a dispatcher. So we self-dispatch and the passenger train operators are always looking ahead, negotiating with freight trains to hold in a station, uh, making a place to pass on the center siding, things like that. Works out well. Sometimes it. it's better without a dispatcher, actually. Um, and uh, John Hans- the dispatcher is Hack. Hack is a great dispatcher. Oh. <laughs> John Hansky is asking how many freights are run during a, during a session. Oh, I don't know. They're just always in the way. That's all I know. The most I've seen as a dispatcher was 46 freights in one session. We had 22 passenger trains, 46 freights. And, and, and up a little bit more about Bob's comment about work on the way. A couple of trains will drop a car in Green River or pick up a car. And there's at least one mail and express train that has to drop a, a car from the middle of its train in Hannah or pick one up in Hannah. And that can be tricky because they often be blocking the main. He has to cross over uh, from the eastbound main to drop the car into the westbound team track at Hannah. Got it. Um, I see one about freight, si freight switching, going up the main. Yeah, typically the yards have a track for them to get off. And the trains that do any significant switching are generally shorter. But every once in a while, um, a yard master or somebody will make a train too long to get off the main and still do extensive switching. And that's unfortunate. All righty. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So uh, Bob and uh, Chuck, thanks for presenting. Um, like I said, for everybody else in the chat, uh, there is the link to the Wyoming Division Railroad. You can also go to opsig.org slash virtual for all of the resources that Bob provided. Uh, so with that, Bob, thanks so much. Sure. I'll hang around after you close off too. That's great. That's great. Don't no lie. And thank you, Chuck. All right. So we're going to move on to, as soon as I find him in my, my list, to Dave. Uh, try to unmute here. There we go. All right. Uh, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself and I will shut up. <laughs> well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Abelis. Uh, I live in Northwestern New Jersey and my model railroad is called the Conrail Onondaga Cutoff. Uh, but before we get too far into that, I wanted to thank Eric for the opportunity to speak with everybody. I'm a fairly new member of the OPSIG crew. Uh, last three or four years, I've, I've been a part of it. Um, I've been a model railroader my whole life and love trains since before I have any other memories. And so I think a lot of us can identify with that. Uh, but it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to see everybody and really enjoyed Bob. What a fascinating conversation. You know, Union Pacific, 1957. I mean, for me as a kid of the 80s, like that's that's the glory years. So that's that's railroading, you know. And 
I think what's exciting about that presentation and, and, and Chuck's input as well, uh, talking about the number of freights he's seen during an operating session, a lot of what we do here on the Onondaga Cutoff is replicate that same kind of trunk line intensity that I think is one of the things that as, as young people, when you go track side, it's one of the things that really got us all interested and all excited. And so uh, I think it's a good segue and it's, it's fun to have uh, sort of the Union Pacific trunk line discussion first. And now we'll go forward with uh, a little bit more of the former New York Central, uh, now Conrail, at least in my basement, my basement world here, um, Onondaga Cutoff. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the Onondaga Cutoff is an HO scale basement size railroad. It's set in 1994, um, but we, we vary a little bit to 1995 and generally try and replicate the traffic flow, uh, the type of trains, and the general atmosphere of Conrail, which was a conglomeration that was created by the U.S. government to bail out a bunch of bankrupt Northeastern railroads after the Penn Central merger, which ended up in a bankruptcy, and uh, the story is, is well known. Um, lots of information about that out there, but what's not as well known is the triumph that Conrail was, at least from an operational standpoint, and effectively how it saved the industry in the Northeastern United States. And as a kid growing up in the 1980s, and then coming of age in the 1990s, um, I had the privilege of, of starting to get to know some of the people that were running the local operation on Conrail. I was able to go trackside. My, my parents were not rail fans or model railroaders, but they, they did tolerate the hobby. Uh, and so we would go trackside and we started to see trains get longer. You know, we started to watch traffic come back to the railroad. And it was an exciting time. You know, people were optimistic. There was, there was a lot to look forward to. Traffic was growing. And as a result, it's the opposite of what Chuck and, uh, and, and Bob were talking about with the Union Pacific in 1957. None of my yards have enough space for the traffic that's growing. And so one of the challenges here on the OC is to, is to work around the trains that are working the yard with Amtrak, with the high priority intermodal trains, the piggyback trains that carried so much of the nation's UPS packages and mail um, and perishable goods through the 1980s and 1990s. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different atmosphere. And what we're doing is basically operating on a railroad in a basement here that was started in about 2008. Um, there's been continuous construction since then. The first operating session was in 2011 with a handful of guys. And it went about as well as the first operating session can go. We learned a lot over the next couple months and over the next couple of years, some track changes were incorporated. Uh, we do operate with the NCE Power Pro system, like we were hearing about before, about the Wyoming division. Uh, I've been very pleased with NCE so far, not only for the train control, but also for the block detection, um, the detectors that we use to watch the trains on the railroad, which you'll see in a little while here. Uh, the first operations, again, in October 2011, so we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary, uh, along with COVID, what we have to sort of keep an, keep an eye on. And... Um, you know, it's, I, I actually work for New Jersey Transit Rail Operations. That's my day job. And we've really been hammered by the COVID response, the virus. Our ridership is way down. And so it's a tough time. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to everybody who's been personally affected by it. It's, it's, it's really an unprecedented time. And I feel that it's fun to be able to come together, even virtually like this, you know, with the skill of guys like Eric. Again, the appreciation for all the technology behind this to really make this happen. And, of course, Gordy over in Scotland. Uh, Gordy, I got a sign for you, bud. This is this is an important part of what we do on the Onondaga Cutoff. So my rule G, you know, the rule G on the American railroads is that you're not allowed to touch alcohol when you're around the railroad. My rule G, it, it omits the word not, so you're required to touch alcohol, you know, in chagrin, of course. Um, but it is a 250-foot main line in the basement. Uh, it's about a 21 by 31-foot room, and it's behind me and around me down here. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of it towards the end. Uh, but the operating session, again, you know, the whole idea of the railroad was operations. That, that was the reason the railroad was built and to come together for operating sessions. Um, we use a 24-hour service plan, and by using a double-ended staging yard, the railroad actually restages itself, which is a real blessing between operating sessions. So with, with the exception of the locomotives, which we reconsist and turn to represent different trains and different operating sessions, the freight trains basically travel both ways. 
we've got multiple consists, not unlike passenger trains, that represent different movements ac across the Conrail main line in 1994. So we do use centralized traffic control, which is as per the prototype in 1994. Uh, we do have a timetable. It's, it's our employee timetable here. And this document, like the real employee timetables in 1994, contains the timetable station information, the special instructions, the physical characteristics of the route. And just to give you a little bit of an idea, it also includes a general map of the area, which is helpful for, for those that are from out west or that aren't that familiar with central New York. So bear with me, we'll do a little manual screen share here. But the idea is this is Syracuse, New York. It's central New York, um, about halfway between Albany and Buffalo, New York. And the Onondaga Cutoff is a fictional former New York Central bypass to the south of Syracuse, which you can see here with the dense dark line. The Chicago line goes to the north, and that's up at the top of the paper there, uh, which we only show for reference. That's not actually part of the operation down here. The... Onondaga cutoff schedules were built with that in mind and, and helps us move freight across the cutoff according to Conrail standards in 1994. Uh, each train does get a train sheet, and the train we'll be running a little bit later on is called the WAON-10, which in Conrail parlance was the way freight on Albany division, and ON is for the Onondaga start. That's where the crew would start that train, so they'd pick it up there. They get their paperwork from the, from the yardmaster up at Onondaga, and then they're able to roll with that down the hill and um, and do their work accordingly. Some trains work the yard, some trains do not. And again, the other challenge is that in 1994, Conrail had cut so far back to try and save money that a lot of sidings were shorter, a lot of yards had lost some capacity. And what we ended up with here was a situation that was really difficult for the operating people because we did have a train sitting on the main line to work a yard. And while they did that, the higher priority trains would catch up and would have to be routed around them. So the dispatcher and the management of the train, the, the crews on the on the cutoff have a, quite a challenge ahead of them in front of each operating session. Uh, our G, we use the general railway signal SA searchlights. Uh, we'll see a little bit of those later. Those are manufactured by integrated signal systems down in Florida. And they've been a, a wonderful addition to the operation here. And the track detection we mentioned before, that's really the foundation of any good centralized traffic control system, any good CTC, because the signals provide your authority and your protection to move your train. So without a separate timetable or train orders and a clearance card, we actually the signals actually cover that. You have your bulletin order in hand and your paperwork, and then your signals provide the authority to move your train. So having resistors, resistive wheel sets on each end of each car, or lit passenger cars or a lit caboose, all of that qualifies. And using current-based block detection allows for that computer, which we'll be able to see here shortly. It's right behind me. Um, and Eric's also going to share a screen for you guys, so you'll be able to see that in a little while. Um, this basically tells you where the trains are. The red lines are the trains. The white line is track that is controlled with signals. There is some dark territory in the yards, top and bottom, which is undetected track. And then the red lines are where the trains actually are. It's called a track occupancy light. And it's based upon the design that you would have seen in Conrail in 1994. So it's consistent. Um, in 2012, when I was installing the signal system here, NCE did not have a signal decoder. And so what we did was we had to approximate. And a good friend of mine, Nick Anchant, who actually works for the prototype WabTech, which is one of the, the modern signal companies for prototype U.S. railroads, he has a lot of experience programming signals, obviously, and he was able to guide me through using JMRI, which is the Java Model Railroad Interface. And JMRI is an amazing program. It's free software, and it allows you to do all sorts of computerized controls of your railroad, everything from programming decoders to a fully functional CTC system to an operations plan, and, and there's a myriad of other things that are available. I highly recommend checking out jmri.org which is their website, and there's a lot of information out there. Uh, I'm sure Eric will post a link to that at some point so you guys can get some more information on JMRI. On top of JMRI, there's another bunch of software called CATS, CATS. And that stands for the Krantic Automated Train System, or Traffic System, Traffic System, I believe. Uh, that is a library that relies on JMRI to operate, 
but it contains most of the boilerplate for functional CTC. And that's what we're looking at here is actually a CATS dispatcher screen. So that simplifies the signal programming tremendously and makes it much, much easier. Um, with the overlay and the signal logic, it operates like the prototype where the dispatcher can move a computer mouse around the screen, which you can't see this being this far away, but the idea is that you can, you can line signal routes. And so you saw the, the green pop up right here. Now that's a line signal and the route can actually, that a train would be authorized to take that signal if it was running. So let me set that back to stop for now and we'll do a little bit of that later. But the key for what we're talking about today, which is the remote operation. So the foundation that we've talked about, the block detection, the CTC, those are critical for my version of remote operation. And there's many different ways to operate remotely. There's a couple guys that have already done it in their own way across the world. And we've seen a little bit of that with uh, Gordy's wonderful NM NMRAX. Um, also with a lot of the Facebook live videos over the last month or two as COVID sort of required it, which is pretty exciting. So with the remote capability comes, there's a couple different things that come into play. So to be able to use a VPN software like Team Viewer or Type VNC, Team Viewer is a free software download. Eric is actually using it today so that he can show you the dispatcher screen here when we get it up in a little while. But the idea is remotely through the internet with an ID and a password that's provided every time you log on to Team Viewer. If I text somebody or send an email to somebody with that login ID and the password, they download the free software. Anybody on the call today could look at the computer and see the dispatcher screen on your computer screen. And you could control it as well as, as if I authorized it on this end. So with that, a primary key to the dispatching, of course, is, is using the computer. And that can be done from any computer with an internet connection anywhere in the world. A real challenge for us was the communication side of things. How do you build a radio system where a dispatcher, a remote dispatcher, can talk on the radio and talk to crews? It was a, was a more difficult little pickle to solve than we had hoped. And so we use the FRS radios, which is just, you know, you can buy these at any big box store, Amazon.com. This is this is called an FRS radio, family radio service. And it basically is a, a legally authorized band of public radio addresses. And these work like a simple walkie-talkie. There's a push-to-talk button on the side right here. Uh, there is a speaker and microphone input on the side. But basically, by clicking this push-to-talk, other radios in the base will pick up on that. And you can actually have a, a very, very realistic simulated radio conversation for your operating sessions by just using these, these relatively inexpensive radios from any one of the big box stores, which is pretty exciting. But to do that remotely was a different challenge because this broadcasts just locally in the basement. The real railroads use a repeater system where there's a collection antenna that listens to the radio and then broadcasts that to a centralized point. And then the radio in the area is able to chime in and they can, all the radios can hear it broadcast from the main antenna. So how do we, how do, we do that? And one of my buddies, Alex Lang, who's been a, a good friend of mine for many years and is also into computer networking as a hobby and as his profession, he said, well, what if we try Skype? Skype is another free piece of software. Skype should be fairly accessible to everybody that needs it. You can download it quickly. It doesn't use a terrible amount of memory. And sure enough, we gave it a try. And after some playing, we actually were able to make it work. And the key to this is to go... We have a couple different ways to do it. But the idea is that each one of these has a setting that's called Vox. And if you look very carefully here, you can see it says right up to the top, it's the top left of your screen there, it'll say VOX. That is the voice activation. And the voice activation means that the radio listens for incoming traffic and turns on automatically when it hears traffic. So there's a slight delay and then the radio will play. So by plugging the computer headphone jack, which is an output jack from the computer, you plug the computer headphone jack into the speaker on a Vox radio, FRS radio set to Vox, and then the microphone, actually, excuse me, yeah, to the speaker, then the microphone jack here is plugged into the speaker jack on the computer. So you're making a closed audio loop with the computer, and we'll walk through this again so you guys can see how it's actually done. But by doing that, now the dispatcher talks on his radio and is able to 
broadcast in the basement and then everyone hears it on their radio as though the dispatcher was on the property. Likewise, when the Vox radio hears somebody in this basement talking on the radio, that will broadcast to Skype. Skype will talk to the, the road dispatcher and it'll play on his computer speaker. So it's, it was, it's a pretty remarkable workaround for a little inexpensive radio repeater and it helps you replicate radio operations fairly straightforwardly for remote operating sessions. So that was a big piece. And the final big piece of it is using Y Throttle. So Y Throttle is yet another free software. It's directly related to JMRI, and you can download it and use your phone or tablet. Any, it's really any phone or any tablet, but your iPhone, your iPad, your Android phone. Any of these will work with this Y Throttle. Y Throttle always advertises locally. Again, in the basement, you, you download the free software, and your phone finds it immediately. Outside the basement's a bigger challenge. How do we get a phone 40 miles away, 300 miles away, 1,000 miles away, across an ocean away, to talk to the server in this basement? And the answer is that actually JMRI publishes on their website a way to do this. There's a link that Eric has that hopefully he'll put up here so you guys can see it. In fact, I already see it there on the chat list. Um, it's the operations shtml it's, it's a link that you can click on so there's a couple different ways to do it online but the, the general idea is that by using the ip address of this computer and the port that this y throttle is using you can manually open y throttle on your phone as long as you've got a, an internet connection and you can input that data and then you can control a train as though you were standing next to the layout which is a fascinating development this is something that took us months to figure out only last Saturday did we use it for the first time. We put it on Facebook Live, and it was a lot of fun. We actually were able to accomplish about a, an hour, and on a three-to-one fast clock, that equates to about three hours of time here downstairs. So we ran seven or eight trains, sure enough, with remote operators. We had people operating from all over the state of New Jersey, operating trains in the basement, and they used the Team Viewer software we talked about earlier to be able to watch the dispatcher screen. And it was just a hoot. I mean, it's it's you, it's the kind of thing that I don't think ever would have happened except for the, the desire to, to run some operations through this COVID crisis and maintain some of the camaraderie that we've worked so hard to establish through our model railroad operations. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the hobby is, is being able to come together with guys and, and accomplish the goal of running some trains. So that's the long and short of it. Um, there's, there's a, you know, there's, the nice part about Skype, again, is it's unlimited call link. There's no, there's, there's, there's no restrictions on how long the call is, as long as you're using it for hobby purposes and non-commercial purposes. Um, we had to set some, some things up with the cable modem and through the, the router that we've got in here. And that's all covered. Again, JMRI touches on that on, on their screen. But what I'd like to do right now is plug in. We'll make a Skype phone call. And then for the last few minutes of my presentation, we're going to try and run a train for you guys just a couple feet so that you can see how that actually works. And I think, I think it'll be enjoyable. So we'll set things up on this camera. I'm going to move a little bit closer so it'll, it'll shake a little bit. And then I'm going to, after we do that, we'll call out to our remote operator, Rich Wisniewski, and I'll move the camera up to where we can watch the train. And then we'll take a couple of questions from you guys. So stand hey, by Dave. here as we get things Dave, set up. Do you, want, do you want me to put the dispatcher panel up for you? Uh, one second, Eric. Let me, let me, um, let me walk through getting the. I'll, I'll walk through getting the Skype set up, and once that's set up, and, we're, and Rich and I are talking, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll give you the high sign, and we'll be able okay. to uh, get that started. All right, thank Sounds you. Sounds good. All right. So as we were saying, the first step here. I'll tilt this down so you can you can see what's going on. So. This is my computer speaker here. And in the side, there's a little headphone jack. This is just what you would do if you're wearing your regular headphones. So you take a regular male plug. This is a male to male plug. It's a regular audio cable that you would use to run audio between any two pieces of audio equipment. We use a stereo plug for the output, but a mono plug for the input. It should, doesn't matter too much one way or the other when we play with it. But the idea is that when you look at the side of your, of your, your FR.
Uh, Dave, we seem to have lost you. Uh, looks like I, yeah, that was strange. I, I'm back. You hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yeah, for, I'm not sure what happened there. It seemed to pop right off. But you're hey, uh, everyone. You get lucky sometimes. Yeah, it's showing your bandwidth is in the red right now, so that might be the problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we've we've had some issues with that. So let me know if uh, if we need to change something. But otherwise, I'll proceed slowly here. But the idea is to input the output from the computer goes into the mic on the radio and the input to the computer comes from the speaker on the radio so you're making a, an audio loop where the radio will hear what the computer does and the computer will hear what the radio does and again this is this is set to vox so we'll turn that on I'm just going to set it aside here. And now we'll go over to our, our main computer where we're running Skype and we'll make a phone call here to Train Master Wisniewski, which was Wisniewski, who's about 35 miles away from me up in Denville, New Jersey today. Conrail Onondaga Utility Ableys to Train Master Wisniewski. There we go. So this is just me. When I press the push to talk on the side of the radio, the Vox, the, the voice activation on this on, the, on my little radio that we plugged into the computer, just running standard Skype. The box turns on, it hears it, and it broadcasts. And then the broadcast goes out to the computer to whoever else is on that Skype call. So think about it like an open block line in 1957 on the Union Pacific or in 1980 on the New York Central, former New York Central Conrail. So those old T boxes and the tower block line, it's very similar. So we're using Skype as a de facto block line. And what that lets us do is literally communicate in real time holding a radio and it, it, it works like a charm so we'll uh conrail on a dog utility able east the train master was nesky are you uh you ready to run the owen 14 with the 77 14 sir see he's looking at the dispatcher screen and i'm not and I forgot that it was ON10, not ON14. So the technology is even, it's even ahead of me trying to keep track of this. <laughs> uh, Conrail on Daga to Train Master Wisniewski, that's a Roger, would be the WAON10 with the 7714. Um, all right, I'm going to move the camera over, Rich, and we'll, uh, I'll be in touch with you on the radio when it's time to move. All right, so we'll uh, pick the, ca the the camera that we're looking at here, so you'll see some herky jerky in the background here. But um, I do think you'll you'll get a kick out of it. So you'll see a little bit of the scenic layout. Uh, just for your reference, we're going up to CP two seventy seven. That's controlled point two seventy seven. So remote controlled interlocking by the Conrail Mohawk dispatcher on the Chicago line on, on my Onondaga cutoff. Uh, I will act as the dispatcher while Rich moves the train. But again, we could dispatch this from any place. And as long as somebody's running Skype with the team viewer radio, the team viewer on so they can see the dispatcher screen and the FRS plugged in, we can communicate and operate as though that's an actual dispatcher's office anywhere in the world that has an internet connection. So stand by. Um, if the internet connection gets a little jerky, don't worry. We'll, we'll get you right back on board here. So we're looking at a little bit of the scenery. This is a, a photo backdrop. The scenery's come a long way in the last couple of years here. All right, so Eric, we, how are we looking there? Is that so far so good? Yeah, it looks all right to me. We can see the, uh, 
We got four red signals there. Uh, that's a Roger. Okay. So these signals, as they are with any controlled signal system, these are home signals. They, they guard the entrance to the interlocking, and they are dispatcher or operator controlled. In this case, it's a remote interlocking, so they're controlled by the dispatcher. I'll go over and line them up for Rich, but what we're going to see here in a few minutes is that I don't have a, a, a throttle on me. This is all being controlled through the Internet with the portal that I provided for Rich earlier, and he's going to run this train just a couple feet so you can see it. And Eric, if you want to, um, if there's a way to share the screen between just this camera view and then the team viewer view. I'm not sure if there's a way to do that with both um, so that they can see it. I think that would be great because they'll be able to take a look and, and be able to watch the signal drop and the train move, and then they can watch the, the track and see light like, go across as well. Yeah, let me see what I can do about arranging screens here. Give me just a second before you start moving. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I'm going to go over and route the signal as soon as we get this this all lined up. But again, thank you, Rich. Uh, and Doggy Utility to Train Master Wisniewski, your horn sounds good. <laughs> so, uh... Hopefully everybody can see. So I've got Dave here on the left, and we've got the CTC board here on the right. And Dave, just for for everybody's reference, where on the where on the layout are you at right now? You a small label on, I believe, the top top right of the screen. There's a little red line, and on top of that red line, there's a label that says W A O N ten. Got it. So if you're watching the Zoom, I'm sort of circling where the train is right now. There's a couple of comments that are coming in saying they they, they see me but not the train, I guess. Oh, hold see on. The there. Oh, shoot. Yeah, we can't. I think the people on Facebook can see both. But um, let me... Well, another option too, there, Eric, is on. that we can run. Okay. I'll just share my. I'll share this screen instead of being able to see the. Or hold on. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Now we're going crazy. <laughs> this is something else, and I I appreciate you you entertaining it, my friend. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yep. All right. So. All right, so we've got the dispatcher panel being shared. Yeah, that looks good. I can see that now. But if and, actually for the people who are watching, if you also bring up the participants screen, you can see Dave's video at the same time. So this is the same dispatcher screen, everybody, that you saw in the background when I was giving the overview before. Um, this is built right straight out of the, the CATS, Crandic Automated Traffic System, the CATS folder overlay for the JMRI, Decoder Pro and Panel Pro. So this is built through Designer in JMRI and CATS. And then this is the system that you can build. It's, 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 you know, it takes some, some time, but it's all pre-programmed for you. So it's, it's a grab bag, and you can assemble what you need to make it fit your operation. Um, very much like what we saw in the 1990s on dispatcher screens at any major hub. So on Conrail, this was done from Selkirk, New York, outside of Albany. But Union Pacific had big centers in Cheyenne and North Platte. Uh, the, you know, even, even SP, was, a lot of theirs was done out of Denver, on the old Denver Rio Grande Western. CSX had local operators in a lot of towers, but a lot of theirs today is done out of Jacksonville. And the idea is that it's almost a universal approach to operation, so it's a nice thing to be able to have. So what I'm going to do now is I'll get off camera, and if you guys watch that type right in the screen where it says CP277, this is CP277 right here. And so what this will let you see is I will draw up, I will pull up a signal route for that WAON10, and as I will route it up to the next interlocking, it's CP280, and you watch well, Radio Train Master was the SC Tom signal indication. I totally agree. Some of the guys have been saying, oh, man, you know, onboard camera. I totally agree. But as you can see, the bandwidth is pushed just by what we're doing. 
onboard cameras are sort of the next step. And I'm, I'm excited about that for the future. But for now, we have to rely on the dispatcher screen and qualified operators to do the remote operation. So I'm going to go pull up a route. We'll talk on the radio here quickly. And um, stay tuned. General on dog utility to WAO and 10 train master Wisniewski over. Uh, Conroe Utility, uh, we're going to talk to the dispatcher here, Rich. Uh, you'll see a signal come up here in just a few minutes. And um, we want to give it a call out over the radio and then uh, take it up the hill. Signal indication, ON10. Roger, ON10, we will look for a signal on And so now, I'm not sure if you guys can see it clearly here. But we have our, our green signal. Zoom in a little bit. Manual zoom so you guys can see it a little bit better. Want to make sure here you go, you guys can see it. Okay. And the locals headed west towards Onondaga Yard. So I'll put this back on this little stand here so I can wrap things up. But um, I just wanted to thank everybody for your attention and your enthusiasm. Um, it's, I love this hobby. I, I love the people that I'm meeting as part of it. It's, it's a fascinating time. And I, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that the best is still yet to come for this hobby. Um, you know, there's... It is, it is a lot of us are getting older and we're looking around at different things and but there's there's a lot of young people coming into the hobby there's still a lot of great things i mean the variety of equipment that's available is spectacular the use of technology for stuff like signaling and radio communications we weren't able to do this even 10 or 15 years ago so i mean there's a lot of good stuff happening and it's an exciting time and i appreciate guys like gordy and eric that are that are really making it come together for all of us. So hats off to you guys and thanks for everything. And again, I'm Dave Abelis from the Conrail Onondaga Cutoff and Eric hopefully will put some um, the, the links up here for you guys so you can see it. Yep. Hey, Dave, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Eric. Yes. All right. Got a, got a few questions for you. Um, Great. Working backwards, uh, lots, of, lots of compliments you can see in the chat. Um, any tips for remote operators? What I was going to mention is on the radio – Anybody who's ever used a commercial radio knows that you push the button and you wait. That's just a normal thing you have to do. So having to do it here to let the Vox pick up, I think that's, that's probably what you're instructing your operators to do as well, correct? That's correct. And in fact, we actually, when, when we do a remote session, because there's been a bunch of times we've done remote dispatching with operators in the basement. So the railroad will be dispatched from offsite, but we'll have our usual operating session down here with 12, 14, 16 guys running trains. And the key is that little delay. There's, 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 it's twofold. And on any radio system, you need to listen before you talk because you don't want to step on somebody that's already talking. You also want to listen to make sure there's not an emergency, something else that's, you know, that's in progress that you're going to step on. So that's always good protocol. And then on top of it, you push, you wait. And then my instructors are operate my, Operators are instructed to say, 
Conrail to identify the railroad they're, they're, they're working for before they say their train symbol or who they're talking to. And that's multifold. In the Syracuse area on the prototype, they always said Conrail WAON 10 to the Mohawk dispatcher because there was two different Conrail dispatchers that broke in Syracuse. There was a, a meet there. And then the Susquehanna had their dispatcher outside of Syracuse as well. So you wanted to identify which dispatcher you're talking to, and it's just good protocol. So you push to talk, wait, Conrail, ON10 to the Mohawk dispatcher or to who you're talking to, and you move on. So the radio protocol becomes really important for remote dispatchers. Um, the other thing is being physical characteristics qualified. And, you know, we have a good time down here. There's a reason I've got a beer sign next to the Onondaga cutoffs because I want people to enjoy themselves. We have lots of paperwork. The railroad runs on paper. But it's a fun atmosphere. There's a lot of camaraderie and good times. But we try and follow the basic rules where people use the right symbol names. They follow their paperwork. And they're familiar with the environment they're operating in. So for remote dispatching, it's extra important to know the railroad, have run it a couple times, just so that you can see what's going on and you can understand how the dispatcher screen works. But it's a hoot. And, you know, in, in these COVID times, it's, 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 our, it's, it's the choice we have. And so we're making the most of it. Yep. I think the, there were some comments about, um, you know, even after this is over, you know, having that remote dispatcher, it, it's, it is prototypical, right? The Union Pacific today has one dispatcher for the entire railroad in what Omaha or something like that. So yeah, that's correct. Um, in, in fact, all the big class ones are centralized. Yeah, exactly. They've got one operation center and then they've got, you know, 25 dispatchers yep. that each control a piece of the territory, but they're, they're, they're literally on the radio from a thousand miles away. If you're on the OSL, right, in Oregon, or you're on the Sunset Route down in Arizona, or you're in Omaha, or you're, you know, down by New Orleans, you know, wherever you are in the Union Pacific, you're talking to their centralized dispatching location. And they use, obviously, a much more heavy-duty version of what we're doing, but this allows us to model the prototype in a way that I don't think was possible until recently when we started to realize that we could piggyback on the technology. Right. Um, a couple more questions and then we'll sure. it. Uh, does the remote engineer stop as soon as forward block shows occupancy and rear block clears? That's one of the challenges that we've worked through. Generally, the train sizes on the Onondaga cutoff are such and the block sizes are such that every train doesn't exceed more than two regular automatic circuit blocks. So if you, again, if you look down at the shared screen, you can look, for example, where WAON 10 is now. So we watched him go west through CP277. There's two blocks there. One is red where ON 10, the label is, and then there's a white one behind it by Fayetteville Station. So those are two track blocks between interlockings. All of my trains will fit between those two interlockings. So a remote operator instead of only looking out at the front of the train, he can tell when he's got a green route, when the, when the track is pulled up green, and again, we saw that before, that tells him he's got signal indication to proceed. But he doesn't know where the rear end of his train is unless he watches the, the red light, and the red, the red tells you where the rear end of the train is. Every car has got the resistive wheel sets, which allows this screen to see if any track is occupied on the main line. So yes, long story short, the remote dispatcher has to watch the green to see where he's got a route lined and then the red track to figure out where the rear end of his train is once he's clear of an interlocking. Yeah. Um, there's a question about try remote switching work at a later session. How um, for Jeff Cahill, actually the um, uh, Pete Mulvaney and I were actually going to talk about, that was what we were going to talk about is how to do remote switching which is a whole other level of, you know, it's the same thing. It's just you have to be very careful and you have to have, I, I don't think you, you could really do it with multiple engineers trying to switch at the same time. It simply won't. I think that would be very difficult to do, but it's <laughs> fun and we may, yeah. if there's an interest in it, we may still demo that in a future uh, version. We actually, we actually yeah. intend, we did that at the, the Facebook live video that we did last Saturday. It's on, it's on my, my the Onondaga cutoff. If you go to Facebook and search for Onondaga cutoff or just Google Facebook Onondaga cutoff, Eric, I'm sure can put the link up there, but we actually did work a train into the yard with all the switching requirements, but you really do need a visual indicator or 
the radio repeater system. And once you get more than one crew working, that radio repeater gets very congested very quickly. Yep. So there's yeah, a, Eric, there yeah. are limitations to the switching. I agree. It is it is fun to do. Like I said, Pete and I did that the other day. I posted a quick link, Eric, actually, just on the comments there to a video recently. So, Dave, I just wanted to say that what you did is absolutely awesome. And uh, I was going to do like a two-minute presentation on my local switching. And when I saw this, I said to Eric, no, no, no. Dave has to do this. <laughs> You're about 50 <laughs> levels above my little setup. But the good news is if you just have a phone on a tripod, we've been able to run some pretty good, uh, quite realistic op sessions. And, uh, you know, some engineers from Australia and the UK, and here I am in Southern Ontario. So all power to you. It's brilliant. And uh, my, my little entry level is a kind of just a way to get started. But I think if you could blend the two, you know, now you'd have a fantastic setup. And I plan, you know, when we are able to get back together for op sessions, why wouldn't we carry on having some remote engineers anyway, right? Yep, yep. Cheers. I, I, I could not agree more with you. And Pete, I, I, I actually wanted to give you a shout out too, because Rich Wisniewski, who ran the train a few minutes ago, um, I know he's watching and listening, and, and myself, we saw your video while we were playing with this whole remote operations idea. So... Your ideas, it's, we, you know, we, we felt fortunate to see what you had done because we, that's where we had the idea for the Zoom. So we actually had this, the camera you're watching right. me from, I set it up with a Zoom account so that my operators could see the end of the yard and at least have a visual cue. So yeah. we're, we're on the same wavelength. There's, there's different ways of doing it. And I, I'm, I'm, hats off, buddy. This is, this, this is a fun new era and oh, there's man. a lot of learning for us all. Yep. So good. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. I'm really pleased to hear you say that. And uh, all right. both being inspirational to each other. So fantastic stuff. <laughs> yep. Cheers, buddy. All Thank good. you. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm not seeing. So uh, John Hansky's question, Operations Pro. Actually, Operations Pro is not the dispatcher's panel. Operations Pro deals with switch lists and car cards and and so on. The software Dave is using is the uh, the CATS. It's a cat's overlay on top of JMRI Panel Pro. Uh, Panel Pro is what lets you lay out these these dispatcher panels. Crandic or the cats adds in. I think it adds in like different icons and so on, doesn't it, Dave? Correct. Okay. And okay. if you if you if you go to the JMRI page or you Google JMRI cats, see just C A T S like the animal, um, it'll pop up. JMRI has a link to the cats page and vice versa. And they are designed to work with each other. You just have to watch the JamRI release and make sure that CATS is compatible with it. But it really is fairly straightforward for people that are used to computers and for people like me that, that are learning it because of what we're doing here. Gradually, you do pick up. There's a, there's a couple great uh, groups.io information sources on the web, the old Yahoo group idea, where you can post questions and, and, and learn about things that way. But you know the, I, the point is that there's actually multiple ways to get this to fruition and i think that's one of the most exciting things about it is that as our community grows here in operations we're able to to build off each other's experiences and everyone's very accessible and it's a it's a pleasure like like pete was saying i mean we can operate you can have an engineer from australia or from scotland yep. running on the onondaga cutoff it's absurd you can't make this up this is so i yeah. just <laughs> i'm tickled by the whole thing i think it's fantastic yep yep yeah. I just wouldn't let Gordy do it after all those drinks. That's the only thing. I to oh, it's hey, Gordy's. He's qualified here. We're we're in good shape. I'll even drink stout with him. There you go. <laughs> all righty. Well, um, at this point, we're I appreciate everybody's attention. Um, we're about fifteen minutes over, but I think it was well worth the well worth the time. Um, Dave, thanks so much for for doing the demo. We appreciate it. Um, there's, uh, like I said, I put the links into the chat and I'll add those onto the virtual page. Dave did provide a written guide on how all of this software works. Uh, basically, now we didn't give out his IPs and things like that. However, there's enough information in there and it's up on the, it'll be up on the opsig.org slash virtual page um, explaining, okay, this is the software you can use. Um, and as Scott Woodle mentioned, um, you actually don't need TeamViewer. You can actually, if you want, you can view the panels via a web page on JMRI. That's actually another, peach, another feature. That's right. Yep. Um, however, there's, uh, and, and I'll throw myself out as, as somebody who, if you're interested in setting this up, um, there are some 
there's some security issues to look at. There are some network issues to look at. Um, I'd be more than happy to to go through that with you individually. It's not really something that works well as sort of a group presentation. It's more okay. How do you? How are you set up? It's sort of a one-on-one -on -one type troubleshooting thing um, to get you set up, but it's really not that hard to do. So, and I'm sure that Gordy and if Dave has time, I'm sure he'd be off also willing to answer those questions but for the meantime absolutely man it's an honor to be part of this eric thank yeah, you if you have those questions please send them to editor at opsig.org um and i'd be more than happy to to go through it with you individually for your railroad like i said the one key thing you need to have is you need to have jmri running interface to your railroad with you know nc digitrax whatever that's sort of the key piece of this um, cause JMRI, if it's amazing software, I'm using it myself. Um, it's, I, I don't know of anything else out there that does as well as JMRI. So, um, with that said, Dave, again, thanks so much for your time. Um, I'm going to get out of your computer right now. So, <laughs> um, thank you again, everybody have a wonderful afternoon and hope to see you <laughs> over on the, on the Facebook page at some point for another live video in a couple of weeks. Yep. And we'll be putting up the uh, we'll be putting up the replay of this uh, once it gets done encoding. Um, in the meantime, uh, let me uh, unmute. Uh, where's the button here? Um, we'll kind of open it up for questions for the next few minutes. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves if you like. Like I, I said, have a question. Go ahead. Question about cats. The L and the R above each interlocking. Is that left hand running and right hand running? So that is a thing that we were able to build into cats with a. It actually means local and remote. Oh, okay. And that's that's something we actually added to the screen. That wasn't built in. Oh, we okay. added. That. And what that allows us to do is have a separate quarters machine under the layout behind you the local control panels and i'll just pardon the pardon the movement here but you can i'll okay. show you what yeah. i'm talking about so this is a local control panel for cp277 okay and that if i turn this on and on the dispatcher screen you've also got it set to local which is not right now because we were just running the thing before. But if you turn this on, then you're able to press these buttons, normal and reverse, and you can actually control the switches locally as well as from the dispatcher screen. And then remote control would be just the dispatcher screen. And the idea is that if you're doing maintenance or um, if we're fixing an issue during an operating session, it's nice to be able to have the ability to have local control. And the Digitrack signal system that we use, the SE8C uh, decoder, has a wiring for that, which is great. Um, but that's, yeah, that's not left hand, right hand, although that's, I could certainly see where it, that, that, that makes actually just make a lot of sense. Um, but that's for the local and remote control of the interlocking. Thank awesome. you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dave? When you set that to local control, what does that do to the signals? My, my computer blanked out there for a second. Uh, do they go red or they, if you unlock it, it actually, the signals will stay as they're aligned. But if you adjust anything, if you miss, if you, if you press any of the buttons to change any of the signals, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll lock, knock everything down to red and it won't let you do that right now. We've got a script that runs within cats. Actually it's in logics, which is something you can add on to yeah. cats. It's a little right. custom programming so that you can't do that under a moving train, obviously. Thank you. You're welcome. I've actually done the dispatching remote thing from uh, my home in Portland, Oregon to a friend's layout up in uh, Washington using the Skype, but we never did anything as far as the actual operations go. So that's really cool. It's. It's, it's a whole new era, and I, I don't know how much of it we would have actually done 
except that we have to do it right now. Right? I mean, it's like we all miss, I mean, this is the thing I miss most right now. I've made a ton of progress on the layout, nice new control panels and weathered some engines, you know, all kinds of good progress, but the operation is what sort of keeps, it, uh, keeps the flame going. So to be able to reach out to a couple guys that are real familiar with the railroad and allow that to continue, even in an abbreviated form, is, that's the reason we've really pushed the envelope with, with, the, with the remote stuff. And then, like Pete was saying before, you know, there, there are other people doing it, and you can kind of tap into some of that, that, that um, effort. And so you can learn from the way they're doing it and adapt it to make it the way it works best for your situation. So it's, it's a lot of fun, and I, I appreciate the, everybody paying so much attention and, and asking such good questions. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we kind of we discussed the same thing with these, these virtual meetups. It's like there's no reason – we couldn't have been doing these all along. <laughs> it's just, we never thought about it. You know, the idea of saying, Hey, we've got people literally around the world in this organization. We never really meet up ever, except like if you might do something at the national or so on. Um, but the idea of, you know, we will continue. I think we will continue doing these even once the, you know, we can start doing operations again, you know, whether that's, setting up you know okay you're having an operating session you want to live cast it great set up a camera point it at the yard and let's watch your session um yeah, you know let's awesome. do these let's do these once a month you know let's still so i think people are getting lots of good information out of these um you know we're seeing railroads we wouldn't get to see otherwise so the idea of continuing to do these even once you know we can get back to whatever normal is going to be, I, I think that'll be, you know, it's certainly a value um, to keep doing them. So. Totally. Hey, Dave, I got one hot tip for you. Sure. So in zoom, there's a setting called enable original sound. And what that does is it turns off all of the noise canceling, echo canceling and everything else, because for some reason, the zoom engineers think that the pleasant burble of a two, five, one, is considered background noise and it cuts it out. So if you watch my early videos, it sounded like yours did. If you turn on enable original sound, you'll have, you would have heard your engines pulling away and all that glorious sound, not just- I, That's a great tip and I very much appreciate it. Thank you. You're most Thank welcome. You it makes up for a hundred things I just learned watching you. So <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, it's, you know, this is, it's, this hobby is about coming together. Totally. You know, and. I know at least in the northeastern United States, we've been hammered by this COVID thing. I mean, it is, it's, it's yeah. an ugly scenario. And I know you get to some of the more rural areas of the country and it's not as tangible. I mean, I, I, a couple of people, a couple of railroad workers that I work with are dead. Wow. My, my boss's boss passed away. Like we, it's, it's been very close and God forbid, I, you know, my family's been fine, but, it's it's a it's this is a dark cloud for us in the northeast and for the world i think in a lot of ways it's amazing that there's an opportunity here for a little silver lining in such a dark cloud so that you know even even in the darkest of times our hobby can find a way to grow and adapt I, to be part of it is it means a lot to me personally and i i really appreciate your advice absolutely you. and uh, learned a lot so great. there was a there was actually a comment out there for the uh, i know opsig is encourages NMRA membership, but it's not required. However, if you're working on your achievement for chief dispatcher, um, this actually, right now, there's no way to do that since you can't go operate on a railroad. Operating on your own railroad doesn't count. However, if somebody's got a session going and they can sneak in a remote remote operator, you know, or a remote, remote dispatcher, that lets you continue to make progress on that, so. Hey, all right. Hey, um, guys, guys, it's Gordy. You have to all continue this just for the Scottish guy who's always self isolated on a three and a half mile square island in the middle of the North Atlantic. All right. So yeah, you, you, know, to watch. you know, there's other places to live there, Gordy. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to be the Highlander or something. You know, <laughs> no, 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 no. There's, there's 600 <laughs> years of Scotch. Scotch there's nowhere yeah. else to live. All if right. you want Scotch, you got to be there. <laughs> hey, one other, one other quick thing. Um, Bob, are you still. Uh, you still on there? Yeah. Bob Ellis. Yeah. Did you have some, uh, those pictures you wanted to share? We've got a couple sure. more minutes before I have to, I have to. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm running out of time myself, but again, yep. thank you for everybody. I really appreciate the attention and the questions. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Dave.
Uh, Bob, if you want to share your screen with those pictures, uh, feel free. Okay. Um, this is the entrance to Laramie Yards over here. Uh, Sherman Hills over here. And uh, this is taken from the mezzanine about where the dispatcher sits. And here's an incoming uh, passenger train. There's also a train in um, uh, Laramie Station, and that's oh, why yeah, he's right. holding out there. Yeah, so I assume this is uh, City of LA 1 and 2. I believe that is correct. It's the first uh, 103 and second 103. Yeah, right. So here's what Sherman Hill looked like before it was scenic. And you can see a uh, city train heading down on track two there. <clears throat> um, this is a movie, but the, but the, the uh, data is all on my computer. So I'm going to give it a try, see if it works. How's that going for everybody? Yeah, it's, well, I don't know what the original looked like, but. It's video got a through, bandwidth problem. Yeah. That's all. It's, okay. It stutters, but if you looked at the yeah. original on your phone or something, you'd, it would be very smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Streaming through streaming is just yeah. painful. So it's yeah. fine. Um, I, uh, I'm working on some class stuff and we have the same issue. Uh, Oh, yes, yeah, another movie. Uh, yeah. Here's Dennis Jury dispatching. So you see the dispatcher's table up here on the mezzanine. <clears throat> that, that sheet will hold uh, 50 trains, 25 eastbound, 25 westbound. And the first time I dispatched, Dennis taught me. Uh, he stayed with me about 15 minutes, and then he abandoned me to go do something else. And I, rest, I did the rest of the session, and we started a second sheet. The owner of the layout didn't believe it. He said, you can't possibly have that many trains out there. The railroad never ran more than 50 themselves, but we had 68 on the sheet. So there's two dispatcher stations, one for the upper level, one for the low level, lower level. Here's one phone, here's the other phone, and there's uh, two separate sheets. Um, yeah, uh, first call, first 103. Again, the backgrounds, you can see how, how Nicely, they move, blend into the foreground. Another movie. Uh, yeah, Hack says this is a steam varnish, meaning a turbine. There's a bunch of turbines on the, on the layout, and uh, they're just as obnoxious in terms of noise as the real ones were. Yeah, as dispatcher, I had a guy stop a um, turbine right underneath my dispatcher station. I had to call down to him to tell him to turn off the sound because I couldn't hear the phone, uh, people on the phone with the noise so coming up that high up to the mezzanine. Uh, this is Dale Junction, just, pat, just pat, past the crossing of the Continental Divide. That's about here. There's actually three trains here. I can't quite figure out which is the heads and which is the tails, but Dale Junction, there's an overview of the uh, switches coming up a little bit later, you can see, but there's Three tracks here, two tracks here, plus there's the crossovers for left and right hand running. The uh, train on the, the foreground on the right is an eastbound going down the Harriman cutoff to Denver. Right. And then the other two are westbound. The one on the left is a first section and the, the, one, the next one is second section of, I think, 103. Yeah, waiting. For they the... had a derail there, so Lenny Wyatt is in the background going to help them get that thing fixed. We don't talk about derails. <laughs> Uh, another view from the mezzanine. This is a, I don't know which train coming into Laramie, but over here, there's another train going down the Denver track uh, to Denver after coming down track three off the eastern side of uh, Sherman Hill. Here's a train emerging from the Hermosa tunnels. Dale Junction is back here somewhere. All right, Bob, um, I'm going to have to cut you off because I got to get to the hospital by six o'clock and I need to get some dinner. So um if you've got these photos in some sort of a web-based location if you want to shoot that to me i'll include it in the uh the event report um these are it's, great it's uh, actually up the hack there is pictures i'm just kind of borrowing them got it uh, got it we, we'll yeah, talk. They're, yep they're all, they're all fine i have to figure out what i can put them into to get them to you maybe if i just zip them all up into one big file i can email yeah. it to you and we'll you can we we there. can put them up yeah, we can put them up on the OPSEG Facebook page or, or wherever, but 
All right, to everybody who's still on, we wanna thank you for participating. Dave, again, thanks for, for showing. Bob, thanks for showing the uh, Wyoming division.